Well, welcome to Community Christian Church. My name is Ed, and we are so glad you're here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about why not. And if you haven't been here all summer, that may not mean a whole lot to you, but it's about something we're going to do together in just a couple of weeks. It has to something to do with these blue bracelets, but really, it's at the core of who we are as a church. You know, when I moved to Coweta County, along with my young family in 1990 to start this church, one of the things we knew for sure is that Coweta County didn't need any more churches for people who wanted to go to church. Uh, there were only about 60,000 people in the county at that time, but everybody who wanted to go to church, there was a seat for them in Coweta County. That's why we wanted to be a church for people who didn't want to go to church, who didn't know they needed church, who didn't ever think about church. We wanted to be a place where those of us who knew Jesus could bring people that we knew and say to them at Jesus, hey, this is my friend, hey, this is Jesus. Jesus, you and my friend, y'all work your stuff out. We didn't want to be a place where we were judgmental, where we felt like we had to change people because we knew God's at work at changing all of us all the time. We just wanted to love people, accept people, and put them together with Jesus so they could get everything together. But in addition to that, we wanted to be for the people in our community. We knew that no matter how much we worked at it, there would be people in our community that would never become a part of Community Christian, that we'd never be able uh, to get them to come alongside the mission of Jesus, but that there were people in our community that God had put in our world that needed to be noticed, that needed to be loved, that needed to be accepted, and we wanted to be for them. The way I think about it is I didn't want to spend a lot of time trying to be the best church in our community. Uh, and what I mean by that is we aren't competing with other churches. We, we aren't in competition with other churches. There may very well be other churches that have better preaching. Boy, I hope so, that have better music or better kids stuff going on. We try to do good at that, and I think we do pretty good at most of those things. But we wanted to be not the best church in our community, but to be the best church for our community. We wanted to be for our community for the people in our community. We wanted to be a place where everybody knew that we were for them. You know, one of the things that we pray every week at both our campuses is that when people come, they would know that God is for them, not against them. In fact, we try to often say that out loud, that no matter what you've heard or what somebody's told you, God's not angry with you. God's not against you. God's not opposed to you. God's not trying to get you to do something. God is for you. God loves you. He wants nothing more than to be in a relationship with you and to, to bless your life. But for so many people, in fact, I would say almost all of us, many of us will never know that God is for us until they know that we are for them. They won't know that God is for them until they see that we are for them. Do we... Want people to believe what we believe? Of course we want people to believe what we believe. I mean, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He's the King of kings. I believe that His words are the words of life. I believe that when you follow Jesus day to day, when you make the day moment by moment decision to follow Jesus, He makes your life better and He makes you better at life. I'm a testament to the fact that Jesus blesses your life when you do life with Him. But in addition to that, I believe that God wants me to be for the people in my world, whether they ever believe what I believe or not. The way I want people to think about our church is, I want people to say, you know, I may not believe what those no perfect people, people believe. I may not go along with everything that they do, but I sure am glad they're a part of our community because of the way they love us, the way they serve us, the way they are for our community, they make our community a better place to live. That's why I'm so proud to be a part of you. I'm so thankful for the generosity you show. I'm so thankful for the way you love uh, people in our community. I'm so thankful for the way that we love each other. I'm thankful for those of you who pray and the way you give and the way you serve and the way you show up so that together we can be for our community. But we can't ever be everything we could be collectively together until we as individuals are also doing what we should be doing individually. And what I mean by that is, collectively, we can never be as much as we could be. If I individually am not for the people in my world, we can't be collectively for our community as well as we could if you aren't for the people in your world. So every year, I try to come alongside and remind us 
by what God wants for us to do and how God wants us to be for our community and how collectively but individually what God wants us to do. And that begins, I believe, with us living as people who've been given a purpose. Now, since we're people who are followers of Jesus, where do you think we get our purpose? Now, that's not a trick question. You could have answered that one out loud. It's from Jesus. We're, we're followers of Jesus. And we get our purpose by following in the steps of our Savior and we buy into His purpose. So I want to start today by, I want to show you one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life where someone talks about, this eyewitness talks about who Jesus was in his community. Here's what it says. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. See, Jesus had the experience that you have, that I have. Everywhere he went, there were people. But when Jesus saw people, he saw them in a unique way. Look at what Matthew writes about how he saw them. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Not judgment, not superiority, though Jesus was clearly superior to everyone else. When Jesus looked at them, he was moved with compassion. Jesus knew that they needed to know that God was for them, that God had something to bless them with. And when he saw them, he taught them, he healed them, he wanted to help them, he loved them, and he was moved. In fact, he said to his followers, I want you to pray that God will send people to these people who need to know God. And that's, that's what they did. And just like God so often does when we pray for something, God asks us to be a part of the answer to his prayer. So when they prayed that God would send people to everyone to know how much God cared about them, God sent them. And then their prayers began to change. In fact, I want to show you the prayer of one of the followers of Jesus, a guy named Paul. He writes later as he's trying to carry out this purpose that Jesus has given every follower. And he's praying and he's talking to a group of people about how they can pray for him and his little group of followers. He says, pray for us that God may open a door for our message. So here's the first part of what we have to do to be for people. I want us to begin, along with everything else you pray, to begin to pray, God, would you open a door for me in the lives of the people in my world? I, I don't want to make a door. I don't want to bang down a door. I don't want to walk through a window. God, would you make a door so people would be open to your message so that I could love them and they could hear about you? Now, if you've ever prayed that prayer, you know that there's a problem with that prayer. You, you know what the problem is? The problem is, is that often when I pray that prayer, because of awkwardness as I feel myself or a sense of I don't want people to feel like I'm pushing anything on them or because in our society we think people think of Christians as judgmental, God opens a door and I don't walk through it. Maybe you've had the experience that, that I've had where I'll be having a conversation with somebody and the conversation will be going really well and then I'll get all the way through the conversation and I'll say goodbye and then I don't know if you do this. I do this all the time when I'm done with a conversation. I wind up thinking back through the conversation after I've left the person and I said this and they said that and I'm going back through all of it and right in the middle of going back over the conversation, I'll go, oh, God opened a door and I didn't even see it at the time. Have you ever done that? Where it was clear there was an open door and you just missed it? Well, a part of what I want to do today is not only to talk to you about praying that God would open doors, but I want us to be aware that God, when he opens doors, I think also provides some cues of how we'll know the door is open and how if we're ready, if we're prepared, we can walk through the door. Now, to get at this, I want to take you quickly through one of my favorite accounts of the life of Jesus. In fact, this is so much a favorite account of it. I've taught it often. In fact, if you've been around here, you've heard me teach this often. It's uh, written by a guy named John, and I won't have time to go all through it today, but it's about Jesus and this conversation he has that shows what I want to show you today. Now, the context of this is Jesus and his disciples, they've been doing a lot of ministry. They, they're from a, a place called Galilee, which in the Holy Land is in the northern part of the country. And they've been doing a lot of ministry down in the southern part in, in Judea. And they've been teaching people. They've been healing people. They've been walking everywhere. And now it's time for them to go back home. And a direct route to get back home is to go through this place called Samaria. But Jewish people don't 
they don't get along with Samaritans. They look at them with a lot of racial tension, and they would walk all the way around out of their way uh, to, to get back home to, uh, to Galilee. It'd be like if you were in Panama City and it was time for you to come back home to our area, but you don't like to go through Alabama, which I get, and so you want to just drive all the way around that. Uh, instead, what happens on this trip is Jesus says, no, we're going right up through the middle of it. We're going to go right up 85. We're going to come right through the middle of it. So they come into Samaria, and they're in the city of Sychar. And in the city of Sychar, it's about noon, and it's time for lunch, and Jesus, they stop at the well in Sychar, and, and Jesus says to his disciples, hey, you guys go on into town, get something to eat, but I'm really tired, and I'm just going to sit here at the well. Now, I can't prove this, but I think what happens next, Jesus never expected to have happen. Because this thing of Jesus taking time away from the crowds and taking time away even from his disciples to be alone, uh, just some downtime, he does that regularly. And I think Jesus is really genuinely tired, and he wants some alone time. And what happens in the next few minutes, I don't think he expects at all. I think what's happening is Jesus is doing what happens to you sometimes, where you've had a really long day, and you've worked really hard, and now it's time for you to go home. But before you can go home, you just, you just need a moment. You just need a break. And so you stop, and you get a cup of coffee, or you stop, and you get an ice cream cone, though I don't know anybody that would do ice cream uh, cone, uh, not personally. Uh, anyway, you stop and you, you're, you're sitting there and you just want to enjoy your ice cream and you want to be alone. And while you're sitting there, somebody you know walks in. It's not what you have planned and you know you're going to have a conversation. Well, I think that's what happens to Jesus. I don't think he expected this. I don't think he planned it. I don't think he had this grand master plan of what's about to happen. Now, to the person that he's about to talk to, there's, there's a woman he's going to talk to. And just to give her credit to, I don't think she has this planned either. See, she comes from her community out to the well in the middle of the day. And that was so countercultural. I mean, carrying water in, in a desert country, it's really hard work. And doing it in the middle of the day is not very smart. So they all did it early in the morning. But she doesn't come because we find out if you get a chance to read the rest of this account today uh, that she's got a pretty... Well, she's got a colorful past, and she's trying to avoid the awkward stares of the other women. You're about to go back to school, and you know what it's like. There's that group of kids that look at you funny, and you don't want to avoid them, or you even have some people like that at work. And she just wants to avoid the awkward stares and the whispers behind her back, and so she's going to go out there at noon. And the last thing she expects is there to be a man sitting at the well when she gets there. Neither of them expected it, but it turns out, I think, this was perfect for both of them. I think God is throwing open a door. And what happens in the next few minutes, because she's, she's a Samaritan woman and Jesus is a Jewish man, they would not be expected to talk, but it's the most wonderful conversation. Jesus has this conversation. It turns out to be the longest recorded conversation we have in Jesus with anybody. And what happens is Jesus, because he is for people, he decides to do what no one else would do. He decides to speak. He asked her, hey, would you give me something to drink? Which would have shocked her. Because one, there's racial tension between them. Two, the Jews thought that Samaritans were unclean. She's a woman, he's a man. A rabbi would never talk to a woman in public, particularly not alone, because there might be some kind of, you know, people could say certain things, and he wouldn't do that. But I think she's shocked that he, he says it. In fact, she's so shocked that she says to him, why would you ask me when you know I'm a Samaritan? Now, I know Jesus is a son of God. And we have places where he sort of reads people's hearts and minds. But I don't think Jesus is using his spotty senses here to sort of know what's going on. I, I think Jesus is just, he rises. This is an unusual situation. There's something going on that she's here. And this is an open door. And he just reads the relational cues and he starts this amazing conversation, which isn't all that unusual for Jesus. In fact, if you take some time and you read through the life of Jesus, which you ought to do that even if you're not a Bible person, just pick one of the four uh, biographies of Jesus and read through it. You see this with Jesus a lot. Jesus would approach people nobody else would uh, approach. He would touch people that nobody else would touch. He would say things to people that they never ex expected. And it was always just the right thing at the right moment. It seemed like he was 
like reading off a cue sheet, like he got a cue that this was the right thing to say. And what I want to talk to you about is something that, again, some of you have heard me talk about before that we've talked about around here, but I just want to get in you that I think that God gives us relational cues when a door is open that if we'll be aware and we'll get these cues in mind, they become a chance for us to step through an open door and not later have to say, oh, the door was open and I missed it. And the way we talk about these cues are the three knots, N-O-T, the, the three knots. The first one is things are not going well. And what I mean by this, I, well, I think it's sort of the cue that Jesus reads with this Samaritan woman. He understands she's at the well in the middle of the day and automatically all of his cultural senses would go, Something's up here. Why, why is she here? And as he watches her, I, I just got to believe he looks at the queue and goes, she probably doesn't want to be around people. Something's up. I, I want her to know that, that God is for her, that I'm for her. I, I want to engage with her in this moment. Maybe things aren't going so well. She just needs somebody to be for her. You know, you've had that experience where you've been talking to somebody and in the middle of talking to them, I mean, some of you are thinking people right now and, Maybe their marriage isn't going well or they're in a situation with a kid and that's not going well. Maybe they're in a place where things at their job have hit a bump and it's just really rough at their work or maybe they have a health challenge that's going on or maybe they're, they're in a place where somebody they love has had something happen to them or maybe there's something going on and you can just tell things are not as good as they can be. What I want to say to you is that is often a door that God is opening up in the conversation if you are ready for that cue. You hear them talk about the fact, hey, I'm in a situation at work and my boss is such a jerk. And you just step into that. It's a cue that things aren't going well and you have an opportunity to step into that door. Now, you, you might be thinking, wait a minute, how, how is working for a boss who's a jerk a cue? I mean, all of us have a boss who's a jerk. Well, really, what I want to make clear to you is, it's not about the specific situation. It's just that when you're talking to somebody, they're in a place where they, there's, a, there's a struggle for them. There's something going on. And if I were in that situation and somebody's talking about a situation at work and their boss has done something and he's really making it hard on them, I'd go, man, that's really tough. And I don't, I don't know how you deal with that, but what I have found is that Jesus has helped me deal with difficult people. And so in this difficult situation, I just want to say to you, why not give church a chance? Jesus has given me the ability to deal with really difficult people. He's made me better at those situations. He's made my life better. And I care about you, and I don't know if it would help, but maybe you should come. And if they said to me, what does Jesus have to do with my boss? I'd go, I, I don't know. I don't have to draw. I, I don't have all the answers to this. But what I know is he's given me help that I didn't expect at the time. Maybe God could help you too. So why not? Why not give it a, a chance? See, what I want to say to you is these situations of open doors, they're not about you giving an answer. They're not about you defending any faith. It's not about you having all the answers to all the questions that a person has. That's not even expected. What you're trying to do is say, hey, look, I'm for you, and I know you're in a tough situation, and I don't even know the answers to this, but church, being a part of the community of God has helped me, and maybe it would help you, so why not? give church a chance. In fact, some of you, some of you are here today, and that's your story. I mean, you're here, and you're here today because you're, well, honestly, you're just grateful that sometime back, somebody, somebody from this place, they, they knew where you are, and you were having a conversation with you, and they almost, in that situation, said to you almost what, exactly what I said, hey, you're in a situation, and I know you lost this person you care about, and I know you're alone, but Hey, have you thought about what, why don't I give church a chance? That's my support group. It's a place where I find strength and God is with me and other people are with me. And you're here and everything changed. In fact, you had some people invite you to come and you were in a tough situation and they didn't have all the answers to your situation. In fact, they gave you some advice and turned out to be pretty stupid. But the one thing they did invite you to do was to come and find out about Jesus. And when you came and you experienced him, everything began to change. And even the, everything in your world didn't get immediately better. You began to be better. You began to be stronger. And even though everything in your world didn't suddenly become perfect, you decided that this was a relationship that you could move toward with Jesus that would change everything in your life. And it all started with somebody who had the relational 
intelligence to in a moment when things weren't going with you well with you to say, hey, why not? Why not give church a child? The second cue is that you're with somebody and you can tell when talking to them that they're not prepared for something. Everybody in here has experienced something. It's just a part of life that it's, life begins to flow along. You, everything is going smooth and then something happens and all of a sudden you're not prepared. Uh, somebody got engaged and they thought it was all going to go smooth and then something happens and they're not a prayer. And, you know, you're in the middle of being married and you're a newlywed and you, you're not prepared for what that's going to be like. Or some of you know people that are just about to have their first baby. And, you know, when you have your first baby that you're really not prepared. And when you're talking to them, you can tell that she's a little afraid or he's a little bit afraid. You can just tell they're not prepared for it. Or maybe they're at a place where they're about to have the third or fourth kid. And I'll just tell you as a person that wound up with, with having three boys that, you know, when you have one kid, that's a learning experience and you're often not prepared. And then the second kid, and you think that's a challenge going to two. But I'm telling you, when you go beyond two to three or four, you got to go from playing man to man, playing zone. And, and everything gets more complicated at that point. And it's often in those relational situations, I mean, even with people my age, you know, kids have grown up and moved out. And, you know, some of you are at a place where your kids are, they're about to graduate high school or they've gotten freedom and they're not around as much. And now you and your spouse are together a lot more. And you can tell, hey, we're not prepared for this empty nest thing. Some of you know people like that. And in that moment, if we're relationally intelligent, when we're, we're talking to somebody, what happens when you're in prepared is you're at a place where you're open. You're open to receive information. It is the perfect time for you to make an invitation. When somebody's not prepared, it's like life is throwing them an, a, a wrench that they didn't know how to handle. And they, they have a tendency to be open to God and open to information and open to community and open to new perspective. It's a perfect time for you to make them an invitation. Now, you might be thinking, what does having a baby have to do with coming to church? How do I make that transition? Again, I just say to you, it's not about being able to draw a straight line to anything. It's about just saying to the person, hey, I know it's a little nervous getting ready for a baby, and I know you're, I can sense maybe you're not as prepared as you'd like to be. Uh, there have been so many things in my life where I have not been prepared for them, but what I've found is that Jesus and his community, the church, they've helped me in situations where I've not been prepared. He's made my life better. They've made my life better, and why not give church a try? I mean, why not find a community that could help you in this time? See, it's not just that there are things we aren't prepared for. Sometimes we just need some people to be with us in those situations. See, there are people that they've been transferred here and they had a job they loved. Now they're to a job they don't like or they moved to a new school and they're in a situation where they don't know anybody and you're going to school this week and they're there and they're unprepared. They don't have any friends. They don't know anybody. And because we are for people, we can be for them if we're just listening to the open doors that God would put right in front of us. Now, there's a third cue. But before I get to the third cue, I just want to say something to some of you who might be here. Maybe you're here for the first or second time and you're thinking to yourself, man, they're talking about cues and somebody invited me here. And what I'm thinking is, did you think I was unprepared for something? Or did you think that there was something going on that I couldn't handle? What, which of these cues was me? Well, here's what I want to say to you. There's a third cue. And this third cue, it might have been the one that got the person that invited you, who cares about you, obviously, who's for you. They, it might be the one that got them to invite you here. The third cue, see, you know God's answered your prayer when you hear the cue of somebody saying, hey, I'm not from here, or... I'm not in a church. You know, if you're here today, you might, and you're a person that's not done church much in your life, or you didn't like the church that you went to, or you were forced to go when you were young, and you just decided to give up because you didn't really understand all of that, and you don't even, church wasn't even on your mind. You might have been surprised when I started this thing by saying, hey, our church was designed with you in mind, and it really was for the last 28 years almost, we've been willing to change almost anything every time we get a sense of, hey, we want to be for the people who don't do church yet. Even though we had already reached some people that didn't do church and now they've become church people because they go to church. We want to change things again to be for people who don't go to church. We want to 
we have people that come and they set up environments at portable campuses. They come in and they clean buildings. They get ready. They sit. The people who are sitting and teaching your kids, they're not babysitting. They're loving and engaging your kids because they are for your kids and for you. They want them to know that there is love for them. And we change everything about around here to be for people who don't know church is for them. I have a friend who... A few years back now, started a church out in Las Vegas that has sort of the same DNA as CCC. And the way Vince always says it is, he says, we started a steakhouse for vegetarians. That's what we do. We didn't start a steakhouse for people who just wanted to have the best steak, and we're going to provide the best steak you can find. No, we started a steakhouse for people who were convinced they never wanted to eat any meat. But we knew that eating meat makes your life better. <laughs> It makes you better at life. Well, that's an analogy breaks down. But anyway, we believe we were starting for people who, I mean, many of you, this is your story. You were sitting at home and you weren't opposed to God. You didn't, you, it wasn't like you didn't believe there was God. You just didn't see any, any reason to go to church. Church was your time to relax or it's when you got projects done or it's when, frankly, you just needed some downtime, downtime in the, and, and the thought that you would spend time at church, it was the farthest thing from your mind. But now, at some point, somebody invited you, and you came, and you experienced something. Honestly, you eventually realized you experienced someone, and everything began to change in your life. And now, your life has begun to change, and you could do other things on Sunday, but now, the idea that you would not have this as a part of your life, that you would not just experience Jesus, but... Not just Jesus alone, but Jesus with the body of Christ. It's the furthest thing in your mind. And you know that there are other people in your world that when you were invited, you didn't think, but somebody said, hey, just come and see. Hey, I just want you. I can't explain it because the truth is Jesus can't be explained. He has to be experienced by somebody. It doesn't have to be with solving a problem or things not going well in somebody's life. It could just be... Hey, I know you're not from here and you're new to town. And hey, my closest friends are at the church that I go to. And why not give church a chance? Come meet some people. You know that maybe they'll even meet Jesus if they don't already know him. Or maybe it's somebody who they've never done church or they used to do church and they don't think they could do church. And you go, hey, I don't know that this matters so much to me and I want you to experience it. Would you come? Would you just come and see? And you know that you're giving them a chance to experience what can't often be explained. That God is for them. And God can be with them. And God can change everything in their life. So here's my challenge as we get ready for Why Not Sunday. And as I come to the end of this first message, and I have one more next week where I want to talk to you about it in a little different way with a little different thought. So... I hope you'll come back uh, to be a part of that. But I want to remind you that we are for people at Community Christian Church, that we want people to know that God is for them, that he's not against them, that God is for them. And the way that we help them see that is by them seeing that we are for them, that we want to be for them. And that doesn't mean that I want you to go out today and go on a mission to win people or convert people or defend the faith. We do not need to defend our faith. It has been defended pretty well over the last 2,000 years by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. What we need to do is to do our part. What we want to do is we want to go love people and give God a chance to change people. We just want to love people. I'm not asking you to make anybody a project. I'm not asking you to fix anybody. I'm not asking you to convert anybody. I'm asking you to be for the people that are in your world. And with that in mind, here's my challenge as we end. I want to challenge you this week to begin to pray this prayer. God, who is it that you want me to be for? Now, specifically, I want you to pray, God, what four people do you want me to be for? I want you to be for four people. Now, that's four words, not three words. Not before four people. I don't want you to do everything before four people. I want you to be for four people. And you might be thinking, well, I thought God was for everybody, and so I'm just going to be for everybody. But here's what I know is true about most of us human beings. When I say I'm for everybody... 
I have a tendency to not be for anybody because when it's everybody, I don't think about it all that much. But when I allow God to put a name and a face on my heart, when I, when I pray and I say, God, who are the four that you want me to be for? God, who are those four? Bring a name and a face that you think in my world that I see regularly. Who could I be for that you would give me an opportunity? When you begin to put a name and a face with it, it changes the way you pray and the way you begin to think and the way God begins to open doors. You begin to see things differently. And I'll tell you, it's a dangerous prayer to begin to pray. God, who do you want me to be for? Who are those four? Who are the four people you want me to be for? Maybe you already know who they are. If you do, then I want you to begin to pray for them and begin over the next couple of weeks to ask God, God, open a door, open a door, and help me not to miss a cue so that I can say to them, hey, why not? Why not give church a chance? Why don't you come? If you're in a discipleship group, here's my challenge to you. This week, if you know the four, I want you to share those four with the people in your D group. If you don't know yet, hey, you share with them, hey, I'm praying, who does God want me to be for? Who are the four that God wants me to be for? And when you begin to pray it, I believe God will open a door. And then you have to pray that dangerous prayer. God, give me the courage to step through the door. God, help me to pray and help me to move. Who do you specifically want me to be for? Now that comes with a warning. God's going to answer this prayer. God's going to give you a chance. And your life, if you are willing, is going to become this adventure of you seeing God at work and God using you to step through his doors that you never even knew were there. Would you be willing to do that starting this week? I want to pray for you. So would you stand right now and let's pray together. God, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to know you. And I'm thankful for people who had the courage years ago to pray for me and to step through open doors and to challenge me to come and see, to experience what you could do. My life is forever changed and forever better. God, I pray for every person who's engaged with us today that you would begin to work in our lives. Draw those that are far away to you. Help them to experience that you are for them. And for those of us that already know you, would you give us the four that you want us to be for? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all. Have a great week. See you next week.